I'm going to share about our response to what Job has said shortly after the next passage. But Job is going to go from seeking justice for himself, for him being blameless, to justice, as far as he's concerned, for those who have made accusations against him. And so he says in verse 7, May my enemy as the wicked, and my opponent as the unjust. For what is the hope of the godless when he is cut off, when God requires his life? So he's saying, those people, you, my friends, have treated me as if I'm your enemy. Therefore, I hope what you get is what the unjust get. And I'm going to tell you what the unjust get here in just a moment. But in essence, he goes, it's my desire that God deal with you as with an unrighteous person. Now, I want you to understand two things that Job is looking at here. Job is being the same as the psalmist, who oftentimes is, is written in their psalm, God, take my enemies and crush them, grind their bones into dust and into powder, and, and avenge me. And, and that's what Job is seeking. He's going, I have been wronged. I feel mistreated by God, but certainly by my friends, and may my friends find out what it's like to be on the wrong side of God. Now, I want you to notice, even though Job is angry and hurt and bitter, he doesn't do what the rest of us would do. We would add to this desire. We would say, God, wipe out my enemies and make me the hand and arm of the instrument of your power so that I might see my enemy suffer and I might be the one who causes it. We want to see justice and we want to see vindication and we want to be the ones who deliver it. Job doesn't do that. He goes, God, you're God. This is my request. You deal with them the way you deal with the unjust. Will God hear his cry when his distress comes upon him? Will he take the light in the Almighty? Will he call on God at all times? I will instruct you, I will instruct you in the power of God. What is with the Almighty, I will not conceal. Behold, all of you have seen it. Why then do you act foolishly? He's saying, you have given me counsel. You have seen the power of God. And yet you continue to act as foolish people do. You know better. You know who God is. At least you're supposed to. You're supposed to be here to counsel and to instruct and to encourage and to sympathize but you don't. You've acted as foolish people. This is the portion of a wicked man from God and the inheritance which tyrants receive from the Almighty. Though his sons are many, they are destined for the sword and his descendants will not be satisfied with bread. His survivors will be buried because of the plague and their widows will not be able to weep. He's saying, even though a wicked person, a tyrant, may seem to succeed at first, God will deal with him eventually. It may not be here on this earth, but God will deal with the unjust and the ungodly in God's time. So he piles up silver like dust and he prepares garments as plentiful as the day. He may prepare it, but the just will wear it and the innocent will divide the silver. He's saying... I don't care how big your bank account is. You can be so rich that your house is, is dusty with silver. It's not going to save you. It's not going to make you any better off. And as I constantly say, you will never see a U-Haul trailer on the back of a hearse. You cannot take it with you. But as Jesus says, you can send it on ahead. And so he's saying, the rich will not be different God will not treat the rich because, oh, like here on earth, if you are the elite or you're rich or whatever, somehow you get better or different. God is not a respecter of persons or wealth because God is so wealthy, his street material is pure gold. He has built his house like the spider web. Or as a hut, which is the watchman has made. He uses this and goes, in essence, 
the richest home is such is that it's supported by a, by a spider web, which may be strong in the sense of how strong a spider web is in the strength of that thin fiber. But even as strong as it is, it will not hold a house. Jesus gives us a different example. He says, the foolish build their homes on sand. So he uses even a more bleak analogy. He lies down rich, but never again. He opens his eyes, and it is no longer. Terrors overtake him like a flood. A tempest steals him away in the night. The east wind carries him away, and he is gone. For it whirls him away from his place. For it will hurl at him without sparing. He will surely try to flee from its power. Again, remember a few weeks ago when we talked about the rich man in Lazarus who was treated well and had fine clothing and the best meals and all of that. But when it came to eternity and the agony of it, he didn't want to be there and he didn't want his brothers to be there. But there was no rest because it was too late. And Job is saying, if that's the same way as the unjust, their wealth will not save them, their power will not save them, nothing will save them. And then verse 23, there is a controversy as how to, to um, translate this. It says, men will clap their hands at him and will hiss him from his place. Some say, okay, th that's from the perspective of humanity. And in essence, there will come a time when the unjust, the wicked, will receive their response from the rest. Others say, no, this is from this perspective of heaven. That God, from his home, will see this and not rescue. how does this apply to us today? Job is convinced of his integrity and we can believe it because before the book ever, as the book starts, it says Job was blameless and righteous in the eyes of God. And nothing has happened to change that opinion of Job. Yes, he's had questions and yes, he's had doubts, but he's maintained his integrity. And in the essence, he says, my conscience bears me no condemnation. As I look back in my years of my life, I don't see anything that I've done to justify this. How are we righteous? What does the God, Word of God say to us? The Word of God tells us initially that for the wages of sin is death. It tells us sinful people will earn death. You'll be held accountable. But God has given us a way to escape death and have eternal life. And the problem is that all too often, because culture and the majority and even churches will tell you that you're wrong, that the Word of God isn't the Word of God, and all of these things, we must stand strong in the fact that it is the Word of God. Because if it isn't, we are wasting our time today. There's no point for us facing Long Beach singing a few songs, hearing a message that some may like and some may say, oh, you could have done better, and then go home and then say, you know, that was a pretty good show for a quarter. But all too often, people are willing to say, well, you know, culture says X. And therefore, we, you know, we need to be loving and sympathetic, and so we give up that portion of the Bible. And science says that it has to happen this way, and so we give up that portion of the Bible. And we keep giving up portions of the Bible. Let me tell you that if you give up portions of the Bible, then you're going to give up this portion. 
I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 10, verse, starting with verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. The word is not just language. It is the word of God. The word of God is near you. In your mouth and in your heart, that is, the word of faith which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, for whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you're going to give up the Bible, if you're going to give up the word of God, then you give up that which means you have no security of where you're going. And if the scriptures are true, and they are, that the wages of sin is death and that we deserve it, then there is no salvation because we cannot trust the word of God. But Job stands firm in his integrity, and we need to stand firm in the word of God. I am not righteous because I'm a great person. Yes, I'm not. I am not righteous because I'm a good little boy. I'm not righteous because I'm the pastor of this church. I'm not righteous because some many, many, many years ago I got baptized. I am righteous because I've been saved by grace. How do I know that I have grace, that unmerited favor? Unmerited means I don't deserve it. And quite frankly, no one who has ever received salvation deserved it. For I've been saved by grace And how do I know I've got grace? Through faith. And that, not of myself, it was a gift of God, so that no one may boast. And so you see people saying, well, you Christians are self-righteous. No, we're not. We're righteous because of Jesus. And we need to stand firm in that. And we need to say, you know, I agree with you. I am a miserable example of Christ. But that doesn't change who he is. And that doesn't change the word of God. And I'm going to trust the word of God. And the word of God says that if I believe in my heart that Jesus rose from the dead, and I do. And the facts are with me. Not only an empty tomb, but a bunch of miserable followers who were cowards at his crucifixion and were heroes afterward. And 500 who saw him at one time. And Paul who saw him resurrected years later. And the Spirit of God who is confirmed with me and those who believe that he rose from the dead. We believe that Jesus rose from the dead. The second part of that says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord, we like to to minimize that and say Jesus as Savior. That's not what the Word of God says. When we cheapen the Word of God when we say Savior. Yes, He is our Savior, but we're to confess He is our Lord, my boss. The person that I am held accountable to and responsible for and that I work for. And I confess, which means If you did the crime, you're going to do the time. I confess Jesus is my Lord. Now hopefully it's more than just with my mouth, but with my life as well. Job refused the attacks on his integrity because he knew who he was. And I refuse to accept the attacks on the word of God because I know who God is. I don't know what his word says. And I know that it's true. And I will not, Lord, help me abandon that. I understand I only have the feet of clay or the feet of iron because he gives me that. And I pray, God, that I never back away from your word. Because if it's not true, then as Paul said, we are of all men most miserable. Because we're hated here and we have no hope in the future.
Job also deals with the unrighteous. And we like to make excuses for the unrighteous. It's a mistake. They didn't mean it. We're supposed to forgive. Love covers everything. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God saw our unique problem, sin, and sent his son to remedy that problem and not only give us forgiveness, but give us eternal life. How sympathetic do you think God will be to those who trample under their feet the blood of Christ? Oh, well, you know, we're all sinners. Yeah, we're all sinners. But we ought to have a little more attitude of Job in a sense of, you know, if you reject Christ, you're going to get what you deserve. Not my rules, not my judgment, and I praise God I'm not God. Because I'd have made different rules. Half the people who or in church today, I probably would never have kind of barred the door. So praise God, God's God and not me. But we take so lightly what God has done to deliver us from sin and death. And just as Job hated the ungodly, and took it personal that his friends attacked us. We should be more personal about the fact of those who reject Jesus. Because he's God's son. And he sent him to die for us. You can't get angry at that. Heaven help you. You can get angry at somebody mistreating you or your children can't get upset because our culture, our friends, our relatives, whoever, treat Jesus the way they do. Now, the scripture says that we're supposed to pray for them. And we're supposed to be his witnesses. And we should do that. And we don't know who's going to respond and who's not going to respond. It's not our job. Our job is to proclaim and to be his witness. It's his job to bring them to salvation. It is his job to give them faith. It is his job to do those things. It is simply our job to be witnesses of that. I'm not asking you to charge hell with a squirt gun. I'm just asking not for us to retreat anymore. Well, you know, that part of the scripture hurts people's feelings. I'm sorry it does. I didn't write it, but God did. Well, you know, that portion of the scripture, science kind of disputes until science learns a little more and then starts saying maybe they were wrong. One of the most disappointing times I had was I took a a theology course in seminary. And the professor, who happened also to be a supply pastor, didn't necessarily believe in Genesis account. He was a theistic evolution. I figure if we can't believe how God started it all, how do we believe how he finishes it all? If we can't believe how he started it all, how do we believe what he's doing today? And how do I believe that my salvation is dependent upon my faith and my confession?
One of my favorite movies. There's a great speech in it. And to rally the troops, he says, they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. We should be saying, you may take our lives, but we will never deny the word of God. And all God's people said,